What is grace? Grace is community. Grace is passion. Grace is for everyone. Uh, today we are continuing our series called All About Love. We've spent the last four weeks looking at what it really means to love someone. We found first that love means helping someone grow spiritually. That's the core of love, right? Then we looked at the special role of children and how clear Jesus was about taking care of those who are weak among us. Next, we saw that lying is not loving. We have to be true to the essence of who we are. And then last week, we explored this idea of loving yourself. It can sound selfish, but ultimately, when we put our focus on God and others, the exact opposite happens. By caring for others, we avoid a selfish kind of love and actually become better at loving ourselves. I think that's a glimpse of the kind of life God calls us to. Now we dive even further into this idea as we explore what divine love is. How do we get that? How do we live with God's love in our lives? To get at this question, Christine is going to share for us our scripture from Luke 17. It's a story where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' time, and they want to know when the kingdom of God is coming. Some thought there was this set time, but no one on earth knew when that was. Others said the kingdom would come when all of Israel repented of their sins. They want to know the answer, but Jesus gives them a wholly unexpected answer. I know we have guests here with us today for our baptism, and normally I would not go so deep into a, a difficult and challenging passage, but it is very strangely fitting for our series. So listen to the Gospel of Luke 17, 20 through 37. Hear now the word of the Lord. Once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, and he answered, The kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. Then he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. They will say to you, look there, or look here, do not go, do not set off in pursuit. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in this day. But first, he must endure much suffering and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so too it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed all of them. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day that Lot left Sodom, it rained fire and sulfur from heaven and destroyed all of them. It will be like that on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, anyone on the housetop who has belongings in the house must not come down to take them away. And likewise, anyone in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Those who try to make their life secure will lose it, but those who lose their life will keep it. I tell you, on that night, there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding meal together. One will be taken and the other left. Then they asked him, where, Lord? He said to them, where the corpse is, the vultures will gather. And from Genesis 1, 27, so God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray as we begin. God, may we be an inclusive community, passionately following Jesus Christ. Draw our hearts to you, Lord, that we may experience your divine love. Open us up to your word and your ways. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Have you ever felt like the work that you do is meaningless? It might seem like an outlandish claim, but there are actually plenty of people that feel exactly that way. Uh, one survey from a few years back said 37% of people felt their jobs did not make a meaningful contribution 
to the world. These meaningless jobs, though, probably aren't the ones you're thinking of. This isn't retail or custodial or fast food or something like that. This is the professional service sector. It's people working in human resources, public relations, lobbying, telemarketing. They say, if you eliminated my job today, society would be no worse off. Take Eric, for example. He is a history graduate hired to oversee a software project in a large firm. Eric only discovered after several years on the job that one partner had initiated the project, but that several others were totally against it and were actively trying to sabotage its success. His job, and that of a large staff hired beneath him, was a meaningless effort to put into place a change that most of the company didn't want. How about another example of a senior manager for a large accounting firm? He was hired by a bank to oversee the disbursement of funds for insurance claims. The company, this manager says, purposefully mistrained accounting staff and saddled them with impossible tasks so the, world, uh, the work could not be done in time and the contract would have to be extended. So in other words, the job was intentionally set up to siphon off as much money into the bank as possible. Their impossible jobs existed solely to leech money from the contracted company. I heard a podcast this week of a, a wager between a hedge fund manager and Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett had given a speech saying he could beat anyone's investment with a simple indexed fund, which is just an investment essentially in all the funds rather than just five or six well-researched ones. Buffett bet a million dollars on it, and 10 years later, guess who won? The guy who did all the research and picked the best stocks out there, or Warren Buffett who just picked all the funds? Well, if you picked against Warren Buffett, you must not know he's one of the richest people in the world and is called the Oracle of Omaha. He easily won, outgaining the hedge fund manager by almost 40% growth. Though I do not approve of gambling in any form, I am grateful that Warren Buffett took his million dollars in gambled winnings and gave it away to a charity that built homes for foster children that age out of foster care. At least some good came out of it, but boy, it must feel awful to be a hedge fund manager and to lose to an indexed fund. What good is your work if you can't beat the average? Now, I know some of the good folks in this church work in the financial industry. I know you are all right, already writing in your heads an email to me, and I look forward to your letters that tell me why I'm completely wrong about indexed funds. But the point still stands that plenty of people feel like their work is meaningless. And the same can be true not just in work, but in a person's whole life. They feel like, what's the point? What good is any of this? And so life becomes about feeling good and doing good. Now that might strike you as strange. Feeling good and doing good, those sound like pretty good things. What's so wrong with that? Let me explain. Years ago, people started looking at the religious faith of millennials compared to other generations. And the overwhelming conclusion was that most people's faith, not just millennials, but most people could be labeled as moralistic, therapeutic deists. Instead of the Christian faith, most people believed in, and I quote, something like a combination divine butler and cosmic therapist. He's always on call, takes care of any problems that arise, professionally helps his people to feel better about themselves, and does not become too personally involved in the process. For far too many people out there, that's the way that they think about God. He's there when I need him. He'll fix my problems if I ask him. But all the other time, I just live my life the way that I want. Maybe you can see the flaw right away in this thinking, but let me illustrate it. I have a, a family member who was really struggling with a problem. It got so bad, this person finally went to God with their concern. They had a real come-to-Jesus moment and were in tears the whole nine yards. So the next day, the person wakes up and realizes the problem is still there. They were completely confused by this. Why hadn't God fixed it? 
They came to God with their problem. They connected with God. This person was even sorry for what they had done, how long they had waited to come to God. How come God didn't make the problem go away? Why wasn't God their divine butler serving up the healing they needed? Not only did they still have the same problem, now they also have a crisis of faith on their hands. They might even think, God doesn't love me, or God doesn't care, otherwise he would have helped me when I really needed it. The whole premise here, though, is all wrong. God isn't here to serve us. It's literally the complete opposite of that. We see it in Luke 17. The religious leaders in Jesus' time wanted to know when the kingdom of God would come, when people would stop rejecting God's authority. Like I said at the start, some thought it was a specific set time, while others said when everyone repents, that's when the kingdom of God begins. But Jesus said, no, you have it all wrong. It's not a thing you see with your eyes. The kingdom is already among you. Older translations say the kingdom of God is within you. The Bible was originally written in Greek, and the Greek word there is entos, which usually just means inside. So within makes sense, except when you're talking about a bunch of people. Then it's not inside one person. It is among the people there. This is an important point because Jesus is not saying the kingdom of God is inside the Pharisees. Those religious leaders kept getting it wrong when it came to what God wants for the people. Jesus is not offering a happy-go-lucky gospel that everyone automatically has the kingdom of God inside of them. He is saying, you keep looking for signs that the kingdom is kingdom of God is here, but there are no signs or events that will prove it. There is no miracle to remove your problem that proves God's kingdom is here. The kingdom is already among us. There are the Pharisees, that's the religious leaders. There are the disciples who follow Jesus. And there is Jesus himself. Among that group, in a very real way, the kingdom is already there. He explains how he must suffer and die, and even that is part of God's kingdom. And then Jesus starts to talk about a further off kingdom that will come in the days like Noah's. Noah's generation was known for their evil, but it's interesting that Jesus doesn't list any evil actions taken by that group. He simply says they were eating and drinking and marrying. That's when they were destroyed as Noah entered the ark. They were just living their lives. But their error was not so much in sin, but in simply ignoring the most important issue. Living life, feeling good, and doing nice things for other people doesn't mean much when a flood is coming to destroy everything and everyone. The same thing is true for Sodom and Gomorrah. Nothing evil is mentioned here. Eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, building. Those are all good, productive things, but what they missed was that it was all meaningless. You may be a bit rusty on the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, so let's brush up on it. It's in Genesis 19. Lot is the nephew of Abraham and lives in this lush, beautiful land, Sodom. Lot is told by some men to get anyone with him out, sons, daughters, any extended family. And when Lot tells his family members, come on, let's go, this place is going to be destroyed, Lot's extended family doesn't listen. They act like he's just joking around. Only his wife and daughters flee with him. So when the city is being destroyed by fire, Lot's wife looks back, and as she does so, she is turned into a pillar of salt. Now, I know that doesn't make any sense, but that's what Jesus is referring to when he says, remember Lot's wife. She looked back. She longed for her home in Sodom. She wanted to go back and have all the things she had before, and that is what led to her destruction. I'm pretty sure this is where movie directors came up with that classic shot where the action hero lights a match and chucks it behind them. As fire rains down from an explosion, they coolly walk off without looking back. Don't look back. Don't dwell on the past. That's the point here. 
There's one last part of this passage that might not make sense right away to you. It says, anyone on the housetop who has belongings in the house must not come down to take them away. Anyone in the field must not turn back. Most homes back then had a flat rooftop and the stairs to get down were outside of the home. The idea here is that if you're up there and you see that Jesus the king is coming in the distance, you have to come meet the king. You have to come down those stairs and come straight to the king. You can't run inside and get your stuff. You can't stop to get yourself ready. This is your one shot to greet the king. Similarly, if there was a disaster coming and you saw it from far off, you can't go grab your stuff inside. You flee. You run as fast as you can. That's what Noah did, and that's what Lot did. So essentially, be ready at any moment to meet your maker, whether it's Jesus the king coming back or a sudden disaster. Be ready. And the way we get ready is not with more stuff or more possessions. We can't be ready with a ho-hum life, just bumping along, eating, drinking, and marrying. The only thing that prepares us for that sudden day is putting our trust in Jesus, putting our faith in God, and building up that relationship of divine love. If we come at God thinking of him in moralistic, therapeutic, deistic terms, thinking of him as our divine butler, we are not in a relationship with God. We are just trying to use God to get what we want. God wants us. God wants a loving relationship with us, not our stuff, not a transaction with us. Martin Buber was a a philosopher in the early 1900s who made the point that often we relate to people as an it. The I-it relationship sees someone else as an object. They are not valuable as I am valuable. They do not matter the way that I matter. There is no dialogue. They are simply a means to an end, giving me what I want. He says the goal is not an I-it relationship, but an I-thou relationship. I-thou is real relationship. It's real encounter, seeing people as they really are. We can have this kind of connection with people. Often it's with a spouse or a best friend or even strangers when you really pause to consider who they really are. But perhaps most important is that you can have this relationship with God, not treating him as a means to an end, doing your bidding, but instead as a real being where love can be known and shared. Here's a quote from Martin Buber on knowing God and who confirms that staring back at Sodom does us no good. To look away from the world or to stare at it does not help a man to reach God. But he who sees the world in him stands in his presence. When we see God for who he really is and stop trying to use God as a way to get what we want, That's when we are in the presence of God. The root of feeling like work or life is meaningless is when our relationships with other people and with God are stuck in the I-it dynamic. True connection in an I-thou manner means the kingdom is among us. And God's divine love pours forth from us into one another. I learned this lesson the hard way. After my children were born, I had the chance to travel to the community of Taze, an ecumenical group that welcomes all all people to reflect on the scriptures, hear beautiful inspirational music, and to sit in silence. So I traveled over to Europe. Uh, That last part, though, that's the kicker, that 15, 20, 30 minutes in silence, uh, total silence with thousands of people, that can be a very unique experience for many people. Sometimes it doesn't feel good for, for folks, but for me... It was a total revelation. Uh, Some of my most profound connections with God have come gathered with others in the silence. So when I finally had the chance to go to France, to Taze for myself, I was excited. Emily, my wife, was not particularly happy about it because she was going to be home alone with our two young children. 
I told her I would line up friends and family to be with her through the week and a half that I was away, and she begrudgingly accepted. When I was in Taze, I was anxious for my time of silence. What would God say? How would God speak into my life, drawing me into a deeper uh, I-thou relationship with the creator of the universe? As I waited in the silence day after day, I kept wondering what profound thing I would hear. By the end of the week, I started to wonder if I'd hear anything at all. Maybe Taze wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Maybe I knew everything I needed to know already. And then at the point where I had basically given up, God spoke. Not audibly, not with an angel or a vision from heaven, but straight to my heart. I can't share exactly what was spoken, but I can tell you the essence of it. God said, you are a father now. Act like it. And in an instant, I saw how selfish I had been in coming to Taze. I saw how with my children, I kept wanting to do things the old way to keep things how they had been before they were born. I didn't want the inconvenience of changing and adapting. I hadn't embraced my own children and the crazy, ridiculous adventure that parenting is. I was turning back, looking at the years before kids showed up, longing for that old life. I'd like to think that since that moment, I've been a better father, not just doing good things for my children and helping them feel good, but I now look at them with joy, encouraging them as best I can to be their best selves. I'm not perfect, I'm nowhere near it, but I have moved decidedly away from an I-it relationship with my family, trying to get what I want, what I need from them, and instead, I choose I, thou, and I have been richly blessed for it. In them, I see the image of God. In them, I see God's love poured out for me and for the whole world. I know divine love because I have opened myself to my family and the people around me. I see God when I stop ignoring the most important thing, that God is here, that God loves us, and that God calls us to be the best version of ourselves. Amen. Amen. For everything happening at Grace, check out our website at gumc.org.